time together with a meteorologist. <laughs> Also, the people who were saying that the Dow is going to 3,000 or something. <laughs> I think we better start. <laughs> Go ahead and get started. We hope you had a wonderful spring break, and we very much look forward to moving into this next stage of the course. So, as you know, it is in this next stage that we will be turning to the next major philosophical and religious movement that we will be wrestling with. And to introduce this, let me give you a very quick narrative of world history that this course is in part designed to reject. That quick ver version of human history would go along the following lines. All human beings for all of their history were stuck in these things called traditional societies, which were these worlds in which they were born into a certain social position. They had to do things like rituals that would socialize them into believing in a certain worldview that they had no individual choice to accept or reject. And in those traditional societies, therefore, their lives were determined entirely based upon their social position they were born into and these rituals that socialized them. And somehow all of human beings lived in these worlds for tens of thousands of years until luckily for world history, Europeans, exclusively Europeans in the 19th century broke from these traditional societies, creating a modern world based upon notions of individualism in which everything would be defined by the individual who would of course have freedom of choice to choose what to do in their lives. They could choose what religious beliefs to hold or not believe. They could choose where to, what to do with their lives. They could choose their careers. They could choose their political order because they had self-interest and they could work with others according to their interests and build coalitions. And you would have marketplace situations in the, both the economy and the political sphere that would give that freedom. And of course, a part and parcel of this great modernity is that we got rid of those horrible things called rituals that again told us what to do when we lived in these traditional societies. Now, one of the many arguments we have been making in this course is that narrative is a incredibly dangerous, restrictive way of thinking. We have, over these past few weeks, been attacking it from the direction of this notion of individualism. In other words, in that narrative, what you get is a, we would argue, incredibly limited and domesticated notion of visions of self-transformation restricted to this simple notion of individuals who have self-interest, who can compete in a marketplace of either for economic gain or political gain, and that becomes the extent of the entire possibility of self-transformation. In other words, taking this extraordinary vision that begins 2,000 years ago and develops and restricting it to an incredibly limiting form. That problem we've been wrestling with and arguing how would we return the revolutionary zeal of a notion of self-transformation based upon love to its radical implications. To do so, we went far back in time, beginning with early Christian notions, tracing that up, looking at the dangerous ways these were picked up, both in a restricted liberal order as well as in romantic notions and Nietzschean notions, asking are there ways we can rethink this entire tradition to return it to that incredible revolutionary zeal? We now turn to another part of that critique. Because, needless to say, another implication of this modernity narrative that has become so standard is that it means nothing that is not leading to European notions of individualism by definition, can have any revolutionary potential of any kind or any even goal of transformation. And not only is that inherently dangerous because it cuts off from us 
every single philosophical and religious movement that has ever emerged in world history, apart from that, that one can trace a genealogy leading to 19th century Europe. But it also, in part because of the very way the narrative is built, takes most aim at precisely the view that we're going to be now devoting two weeks to looking at in depth. Because if you want to think through what would be the most perfect example that perfectly matches our stereotypes of that traditional worldview that we build into our modernity narratives, um, I suspect for most people that would be Confucianism, right? I mean, here's Confucianism that literally is about, among many other things we'll see, but it certainly is about rituals. I will even be discussing later a statement attributed to Confucius. And this is literally the statement in your translation that we're reading for today. It's actually been domesticated a bit to not sound quite as extreme. So I'll, let me just give a very straight literal translation. To become humane, you must conquer the self by submitting yourself to ritual. <laughs> conquer the self by submitting yourself to ritual. I mean, it's difficult to imagine a sentence that will more flawlessly match our vision of the horrible parts of what it would mean to live in a traditional society. And Confucius literally says that. So, we have thus far been arguing how we need to rethink our modernity narratives to see the revolutionary power of notions of radical self-transformation, pulling it from the way it's been domesticated. Here, we will be doing it from the other side, which is to say, what about those other movements that emerged at roughly the same time, mid-first millennium BCE, and then continuing, that were also about transforming the world, but in this case, as we will see, through a very different understanding of what that would mean, where it would take you, and practically what the implications would be. So today, we will turn to Confucianism and do exactly what we have been doing these past few weeks with the vision of self-transformation, and before that, of course, with Buddhism, look at how the ideas emerged, what those ideas were in their most powerful form, how they were institutionalized in ways that are potentially exciting and yet clearly very dangerous in terms of how they were domesticated. And we do that exercise because it will hopefully help us then to think, what would it mean to revitalize them today in ways that would hopefully build on the potentials and yet avoid the dangers that we can see historically have also played out. To do so, let us jump back to mid-first millennium BCE, where to, re to remind you of this key moment in world history, we are at the moment when all of these old Bronze Age hereditarily based societies are beginning to break down. Now, when we go back to our narratives of traditional societies breaking into the modern, um, it's not that there have not been societies in world history that match our definition of a stereotypical traditional society. And indeed, among those that pretty closely, flawlessly match it would be these old Bronze Age societies. So, as we noted earlier in the course, for about two millennia, Eurasia was dominated by huge, hereditarily based Bronze Age aristocratic societies. They were indeed defined entirely by birth. You would be born into a certain social station, and there you would stay. There was virtually no social mobility of any kind whatsoever. The entire religious sphere was defined by that hierarchy, meaning that the kings would work exclusively with a set of priests who alone had access to the highest powers that would therefore keep the kings in power, as well as the entire aristocratic order. And it pretty closely matches our vision of a traditional world. We also noted it is in the mid-first millennium BCE, for various reasons we don't need to detail again here, that all of these Bronze Age kingdoms across Eurasia collapse. And in the midst of that collapse, you get this fluorescence of philosophical and religious movements, as we've noticed many, noticed many times, um, even our terms, philosophical and religious, almost don't capture the power of these movements, that were attempts to radically rethink the world. We have now seen two of these, one the Buddhist tradition, 
the other one that, co that comes out of the farther end of Western Eurasia. We looked at particularly in the form of the Datopian Christianity. And now we turn to the eastern end of Eurasia, where at roughly the same time, you have figures like Confucius, Mencius, Shunzi, Zhuangzi, roughly the same time, also trying to radically rethink the world, calling for radical transformation, but as we will see, they mean transformation in a different way, based upon very different understandings of what change means, and our goal here today will be to try to understand what they meant, to try to take it seriously, both in terms of how it could challenge our assumptions, and to wrestle with it. To take it seriously means we will wrestle with it and see its powers and potential weaknesses. So, let us jump in, and let us jump in to that quotation that I just mentioned, which indeed is attributed to Confucius, and boy does he mean it. Submit yourself to rituals, and when you do so, you're conquering the self. So, let's talk about this. Let me begin with the self that you're indeed conquering in this way of thinking, then I will turn to ritual that, as we will see, not surprisingly, given what we will have seen about the self, will actually mean something a bit different than we tend to think of ritual in our standard modernity narratives, and what it means, therefore, to think of transformation along these lines. So let's begin with that self. So in the early Chinese tradition, which will come together in Confucius, as well as several other figures, including figures like Zhuangzi, etc. This is before there are clear schools of thought in China, so these are all building on each other. In these early thinkers, what are you? Do you have, to give a not random example, we've seen it repeatedly in contemporary standard American assumptions about the self, do you have some true self lurking in there at birth? that you're trying to look within and find, that you're hoping once you find, you can live your life according to choosing a career, partner, etc., that perfectly matches who you intrinsically are? Are you being told to learn to love and embrace this true self, loving your good qualities, of course, but loving your bad qualities, too, because they're just you, and you should love who you truly are, and therefore living your life as a true individual? a notion, as we've seen in the past two weeks, that is a grossly and dangerously domesticated version of what radical transformation would really mean. And let me say now, the critique would be every bit as strong, but would be going in a very different direction once we take in early Chinese thought. So, no, you are not some true self there already that you're supposed to look within, find, love, and embrace, and live your life according to for the rest of your existence on this planet. In fact, just about nothing could be further than the, tr than the truth. So let me tell you what you are. You are a mess. You are a mess of junk, a mess of energies and faculties and just stuff that we can give different names to, and we'll see later why we do give names to them to try to understand how to change them, but it's just a big bunch of mess. And among this mess are a bunch of energies, the, the Chinese term has begun to make it into the American lexicon, so this is the term qi, so qi. So a bunch of these energies are just seething around in us. And they're seething around, by the way, in other things, we can call them you know, humans, and non-humans too. Like the whole world is just a mess of different energies. And how does the world come to existence, both for us and for everything else? Well, the messes encounter and interact with other messes. So let me begin with those things that we call humans, and we'll see quickly, this will take us to the rest of the world too, but let's get back to you. So imagine you, you're, you're born, and you're a mess, we're all equally big messes at birth, and then you, early on, start interacting with other things, um, everything, like just the rooms you're in, the lighting, everything begins pulling out different bodies of energies within you, because everything else are energies too. And among the other things that you interact with very early on, by definition, 
are other big messes that, again, we'll just call for the moment um, other humans. And when you interact with them, you will drag out from each other different ones of these energies. And this is going to be particularly true for you at a young age because you have not yet hardened into what we'll see you're going to be hardened into. So you're a really, really pliable bunch of messes. And so when, for example, someone walks in the room and smiles at you, you're happy. It, meaning in this way of thinking, that act, that smile, drags out from you an energy of happiness. So you're momentarily happy. And then someone walks in and yells at you. You're angry, but again, in this way of thinking, that anger that you're being, that being screamed at drags out from you an energy of anger. So you're filled with anger. And as you can see, our opening danger as humans from a very young age is we are totally passive in this. I'm happy, I'm angry, I'm sad, just based upon immediate interactions around me. And the word drag, it's literally, that's a literal translation of the Chinese. It's being dragged out from you. So that sounds a little bleak, right? That we're completely passive in the world. Uh, no, that's peanuts compared to where it goes. Because very, very quickly, we cease to actually respond to things that we're actually interacting with. So at least in my example so far, like the person does smile and the person does yell, and so I, I'm actually at least at the minimum purely passively, but at least passively responding to someone yelling and, and smiling. Well, very early on, we fall into habits of responding. And so someone smiles at me, I'm happy. Someone walks into the room right afterwards and does something not even necessarily particularly nice, but for whatever reason, it emotionally reminds me, in part just because it just happened, of the person who smiled at me. So it equally drags out from me that energy of happiness. Someone else walks in and does something not at all intentionally mean, but for whatever reason, again, maybe just because it literally happens right after, it equally, whatever that person does, even smiling in this case, drags out from me that energy of anger. And very quickly, we fall into habits of responding to the world, habits of responding to those around us that have very little to do with who we're actually interacting with, what their intentions are, what they are even doing. Those habits become so part of our mode of being that as we grow up, they become intrinsic to how we interact with the world. So much so that we could even call them a personality if we were being incredibly, incredibly foolish. We could even think of it as a true self because it so defines how we live our lives. When they say this, they mean this in a strong sense. When you walk down the street, it is stunning, and we'll get later to how they know this and what they're going to argue to, to change this, but their argument will be, it is stunning how little you actually see. It is stunning how little of the world you are actually seeing when you live in it. And when it comes back to those other messes that again, we'll just provisionally call other humans, it is amazing how little we actually relate to anyone. I don't just mean distant strangers. I mean from this way of thinking, in fact, even more dangerously, we, as we will see, those who we foolishly think we are closer to. So given the way these patterns set in, you would not be surprised, but will undoubtedly be horrified to hear, it's often with those you are most involved with close family members, friends, loved ones, that you become embedded in the most extreme versions of these hardened patterns. And not only with those specific people, but again, because these habits and patterns keep playing out, they play out with anyone you ever meet. Now, if you're thinking this sounds overly bleak and this couldn't really be the case, um, there are many arguments I can give to show the degree to which it is. Let me just begin with a kind of obvious one. Um, 
have any of you, I'm sure you're not personally, but do you have any friends who maybe you might have noticed that they kind of have the same relationship over and over again regardless of who it is they're dating? And you as a friend see this every time. They go out on the first date, things seem fine. Second date, things seem fine. Third date, they're like, you know, I'm beginning to wonder about this person. He's like, oh my God. <laughs> and then you as a friend say, you know, I, I really think you're kind of, you know, not really acting, interacting with this person. I've met the person, they're perfectly nice. And <laughs> it's not like those previous 17 people you were dating the past <laughs> 17 weeks. And, and, and this is maybe a different situation, but it makes no difference because of course these are just hardened patterns that play out and you know how that relationship is going to play out it will end up in a disastrous mess but you know how it's going to happen because it's flawlessly predictable you just play it out over and over and over again and then imagine the possibility that this is what our lives are like we are just these machines that play out these habits and patterns over and over and over again throughout our entire lives and if this isn't sounding bleak enough already, let's keep going. <laughs> so I've so far been talking about us and our immediate interactions. But if this is what humans tend to be like, then of course, by definition, sadly, it doesn't end there. Because these habits and patterns can become embedded in entire social worlds. And not just will we personally continue patterns for our lifetimes, they can become embedded in entire societies and continue generation after generation after generation. To give you a not random example from the time in, in question here, for about two millennia, as we have already seen, people lived in these Bronze Age hereditary societies with virtually no social mobility for two thousand years where the patterns are just so embedded that if you're born into an aristocratic family uh, of course you're an aristocrat and those below you are below you and if you're born a peasant you're a peasant and, and those above you are aristocrats and it's amazing the degree to which that just becomes our lives in that case for two thousand years now that's their problem um needless to say we have the same problem. Let me give some obvious examples. So, we live in America. We're good liberals, right? We have no discrimination. <laughs> we, 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 we treat everyone as good individuals, and as long as they are being true to their true self and loving and embracing who they are, we respect them as true individuals, and we support them in what they all want to do, right? Um, well, <laughs> Sadly, um, as we know very well, despite that claim we love to tell ourselves, if you look historically at any possible indicator, and let's just give some obvious ones, social inequality, income inequality, they are at levels not far off from where they were, say, let's give an extreme example from, from historical experience, 18th century France, where you had a purely, again, purely hereditary order. Everything was based entirely upon birth, an aristocratic class that controlled all land and wealth, everyone arrayed in aristocratic uh, um, sets below, no social mobility. Our levels of income inequality and our levels of social mobility are about the level as they were in 18th century France. That's actually historically true. You might think, OK, well, um, at least we can see problems in America and alter them. So well, what about the fact that, you know, look at, at America in the 1960s. Uh, women, for example, had almost no chance of having a career. And we've changed that, right? Well, let me give a simple example. You know, we're all in the educational sphere. Um, if you look at the educational sphere, I actually tried this as an experiment, by the way. If you asked people, I mean, there's a growing realization of this, but up to about five years ago, if you asked people and said, um, do you think there's a gender problem in, say, hiring in higher education? Like the, the fact that faculty all seem to be kind of white and male? And the answer is almost across the board, was almost across the board a few years ago. Um, well, yeah, I think we still have a problem, but we're just getting better and better. So we're working on it. You would hear that over and over again. Let's again look at statistics. So in the 1970s, yes, laws were put in place that made it illegal to overtly discriminate. 
because of those laws, you see a little jump in numbers of female faculty being hired. That's true. Still pretty low, but it, there is a jump. Then in terms of that claim, things are getting better and better. Um, no, it is flawlessly flat from about 1979 until today. Flat, flat. And most hiring committees in most faculties are honest, good liberals in their own self-understanding. Needless to say, however, when it comes to hiring decisions, they have, to use this terminology, patterns and habits that play out. And needless to say, we can continue these examples. Race discrimination, religious discriminations, discriminations of all types that just continue generations after generations after generations, even in self-consciously claimed liberal worlds. So the patterns, in other words, can continue even if you do not have, as you had, for example, in these Bronze Age societies, religious worldviews that said, yes, it is religiously pre-given that you'll be born into a station of life. Um, in America, that isn't the claim, and yet that is absolutely the practice. In other words, these patterns play out regardless of some worldview. You can have a liberal worldview, and the patterns play out just in the mundane way, ways. We see people, we relate to people, it's by pattern, and it's by habit. So, that's the world we live in from this point of view. If that might be, possibly, an accurate description of some of what we humans, sadly, are like, um, both at a mundane level and to the degree to which these can become embedded in social worlds that can continue for generations and, we can see over the span of world history, centuries and millennia. How do you change it? Well, now we get to part two of the challenging ideas, possibly the more challenging of them, ritual. So, from this point of view, as we've already seen, this isn't a question of belief, right? Like even in the example we just had, liberal America, you can believe you're a nice, good liberal and still in your life practice be horrifically discriminatory. There seems to be zero problem there. And so simply telling people you should be less discriminatory, and it's important to say that, in the 70s it was good to have those laws put in place, but they're in themselves inadequate. So, what do you do? If this tradition is right in saying these habits and patterns are so embedded in our just mode of being in the world at the most mundane ways that we talk to people, form friendships, everything, then, according to this way of thinking, that's where the change has to begin. And how do you do it? Yes, you do rituals. Now, you might immediately say, but wait, how could that possibly solve the problem? Because wouldn't rituals just socialize you into different patterns, <laughs> which from this point of view would hardly be better. In fact, it could arguably be worse because if you're doing a bunch of the same rituals, socializing you into one way of being, it would, couldn't it just you know, <laughs> make the problem, if anything, much, much worse? Well, needless to say, we have to look at what they mean by rituals. Let me begin with a very specific example that they will give, and then I'll work out the larger implications. So let me begin with an example from the early Confucian tradition. So let's now remember the patterned world they're dealing with. We will be dealing with, well, I'd like to say pa different patterns. Sadly, most of these patterns, sadly, are very much part of America today. But let's begin with their patterns, as they would put it. So they are dealing with a world these hereditary worlds of the Bronze Age are beginning to crumble, but Confucius is living in a day when they're still very actively there in existence, and the beginning part is something we know in retrospect. So in this world, let's imagine you're a king, which in this world, it's still very much the Bronze Age hereditary world, means by definition, you are male. Let's also assume that you have a son um, who by definition is male, but I emphasize that strongly because that means that he's going to replace you. And remember, of course, since everything is based upon heredity, um, you as the king are king for one reason, which is that your father died and you replaced him. So let's imagine what patterns and habits would set into a world 
that is flawlessly patriarchal. Um, I'd like to say it takes a lot of imagination. Sadly, we live in more of a, that type of a world than, than we would like to think, so it's not a radical act of imagination. And we can probably pretty easily imagine a piece of it. Um, you're the ruler. Finally, after decades of waiting, you have come into your power, and now you can rule. I mean, yes, <laughs> there, there was this father up there. I mean, everyone loved dad. I mean, he was this popular king. Oh, he knew when to throw out free grain. Um, at the certain moments when people were going hungry, they thought he was this beneficent figure, but you know what he was like. I mean, he was this horrible temperamental guy. I mean, he just had the worst temper. And I mean, yeah, I mean, he threw out grain at certain moments because his ministers would say, hey, you know, care about people, it'll make you more popular if you throw out some grain, he couldn't care less about people, he certainly couldn't care less about me, his own son, he was just this horrible human being, and now he's dead. Um, now, of course, being dead, that means um, in a world of energies, all of what I just mentioned, they're not gone. Um, actually, we can even call him a ghost now, and all of his anger is still there, and all of my anger and resentment against him that I just mentioned is still there, except since he's not physically in a form, I can't yell at him as easily, and so all of that continues. And how does that play out? Well, then you've got your son. Oh, your son. The people love him too. He's so cute. Oh, look at little Junior. Everyone loves him, but you know, he's just this lazy kid. He does nothing. He's going to take over my place? This lazy kid? I mean, he's nothing. Everyone loves him. They love Dad. They love little Junior. But, I mean, it's going to be a disaster. No one's respecting me. I mean, I'm the one who's doing all the work. I did it before. I was telling Dad what to really to do. I was with the minister saying, give them some grain, give them some grain. I got no credit, and now Junior, everyone loves him. I bring him out in the court, and everyone shouts their joy, and look, they just hate me. In other words, all of my patterns and habits with my father, I flip around and throw on my son. And needless to say, that will go on generation after generation after generation. So, how do you break this down? We'll get momentarily to how you break down the hereditary order in general institutionally, but first, again, they always will say, you begin, or at least a key part of what you need to do is at this mundane level where these patterns form and just continue endlessly. So here's what you do. You have a ritual where the three of you, you, your son, and angry dad up there, all three of you enter the ritual space. And let me describe the ritual. You and your son, and your dad is being called down as well, but I'll focus now on you and your son for a moment. You and your son walk to the edge of the ritual space, and then you stop. Then you walk in without blushing. Now that might seem like a really odd little detail, but here's why you can't blush. Because when you walk in, you're no longer you, and your son is no longer your son. When you walk into the space, your son is your father, his grandfather. When you walk into the space, you are the son of your son. He, your son, but he's not your son anymore, he's your father, sits on the throne. He's your ruler. You, but you're not you anymore. You face north looking up at him, which in, in the ritual position of China is where you look up toward the monarch. He looks south. You look up at him, your son, but again, he's not your son anymore, and you pay him proper obeisance, being subordinate to him as your ruler and your father. He, your son, but now he's his grandfather, looks down on you, who the person who was, who was just yelling at him two seconds before, <laughs> get in this ritual, kid, um, suddenly, there he is, <laughs> subordinate to you. You, the son is learning from an intensely young age what it means to be in a position of power. The incredible sense of responsibility that comes from it, the incredible dangers of arrogance that can come from it, all of the worlds that he's been living in as the sort of receiving end of his father's <laughs> issues, um, 
he's now sensing because he's in that position. And you, again, you're the ruler, but now you're the son of your own son. You're looking up at him, uh, once again having to deal with your father, not your father as he really was, but your father as what he ought to have been, sitting on that throne, once again dealing with him, but needless to say, the reason the ritual works is you have to look at your own son when you're dealing with your father again making it painfully clear, not just conceptually, not even remotely conceptually even, but emotionally in terms of your energies and dispositions, you are seeing, in a very literal sense, how these patterns are playing out. And you're being forced to see what it's like yet again to be back in that position of the subordinate one in a patriarchal order looking at a father who controls you. Then you get up and you walk out of the ritual space, and you're back to being you, and your son is back to being your son, and you can finally yell at him again, and blah, 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 but then you go back. And this is one of the myriad set of examples of things you're doing all the time. These rituals that, as you can now begin to get a sense of, are all about forcing you to shift your relationships with those around you. In this sense, literally a direct set of role reversals where you are physically taking not just a different position than you would normally take in, in the mundane reality where you usually are, but in this case, the position with the figure or figures, including your father, with whom you have the most intense, in this part of your patterned existence, most intense set of tensions, and actively forced to live the world from that different perspective, but again, in perspective, in relationship with the other. In other words, if everything is about these interactions, what the ritual is forcing you to do is physically interact with those that you were otherwise dealing with by rote habits and patterns in not just different ways, but oftentimes literally the precise opposite way of the way you usually do it. Now, why? <laughs> if they mean, and they clearly do, that this isn't simply conceptual, um, if the goal isn't simply that you walk out and say, oh yeah, I guess I am kind of playing out the same patterns on poor Junior that, I, <laughs> that, that Dad was playing out on me, um, and I should think about that, if they're right that that's not going to do anything to change your behavior in practice, then what's the goal of this? Here's the goal of this. The argument is that ritual is not training you to be the thing in that ritual. So you're not being trained to be the son of your son, for example. The reason you do ritual is, think of it as a training. It is training you to, over time, you're doing these constantly, all the time, you're training yourself over time to begin to not respond to other things purely by patterns. In other words, think of the rituals not as socializing you into a way of being. Think of the rituals as training you to break from these habitual modes of being. Meaning the following. Were you to do this in the way they're calling on you to do it, it wouldn't simply be that you would then make you be the son of your son. It's that you would in practice become or forced to become would be the better way to put it. You're being submitted to rituals. You have no choice in this. You're being forced to sense how those patterns are playing out in your mundane life, in this example, with poor Junior, and how, in practice, you can begin to shift this. Let me deal with that latter point in a little bit more detail. What this would mean is the following. If we are really messy creatures who harden into these set patterns that can, again, define entire social orders for generations, centuries, and millennia, then beginning at that mundane level, what you're trying to do is break down these habitual modes of being to gain a sense of, and I'll use just literal translations of the terms they would use, you're trying to refine your abilities to respond to others. You're trying to become literally more responsive to others, but more importantly, more responsive to the messiness of others. And if you begin to do this, and it's a lifelong work of training that you'll never achieve the final result of, but you get better and better at doing it, that's what they mean with this term humaneness. You're conquering the self by submitting yourself to ritual 
to become humane. And think of humaneness as this open-ended word. Probably the closest you could get to it in English would be something like care, but even that slightly pushes it. So let me give you a, a, some details as to what they mean. What they really mean about by this is it's a sensibility in which you are learning to sense the world you're living in, sense the degree to which the world you're living in is not the way things are, or rather that it is empirically the way things are, but because things have been hardened into these patterns, and you're learning how to sense things you can do to alter those patterns, alter those habits in ways that will allow people to begin to interact in ways that would then allow the possibility of flourishing. Now, that's, that's an absurdly long sentence. Let me get very concrete examples. And to do so, let me go back to one of the texts you're reading for today, the Analects of Confucius. So I think a way to read the Analects is this is a text written by the disciples of Confucius, and they're trying to describe him. And if you read it as a series of philosophical statements, um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> A lot of them just don't seem to be terribly philosophical, to put it mildly. Um, it's not intended to be read that way. I think what it's intended to be is a portrait of a figure, in this case Confucius, of someone who's done this, like someone who through ritual training over the course of a lifetime has achieved this. And so let me talk about that portrait because this is what they're aiming for, for the sense of humaneness. So Confucius is described as a figure who in everything from the most mundane moments to the most politically complicated moments, but they're seen as just you know, part of the same spectrum, he is described as someone who can sense these habits, sense these patterns, and sense what to do to alter them. So at a very mundane level, a typical description of Confucius is he walks into a room, he immediately senses the patterns that are playing out around him, and he will just do something. So he'll quote a line of poetry, he will make a gesture, he will say something. Sometimes these kind of seemingly mundane statements from the Analects, um, but they're all about something he will do or say or utter or some gesture he will make that will bring out different responses from those around him in a way that will shift these patterns in some way that for that brief moment allows them to actually begin interacting. In other words, what he's doing is the equivalent of sensing a situation and doing a ritual to break the patterns, but there's no pattern, I mean, there's no ritual telling him what to do, right? He doesn't go in and say, okay, let's do a role reversal ritual. And <laughs> like, he just, he's so good at this, he can just sense it and he just does things. It's the same in the political sphere. If he can do that at the most mundane level of daily existence, at the political sphere, it's the same thing. What are these larger patterns that are playing out? And what are the things we can do to shift those patterns, to break those habits, to open up the possibility of interaction? He himself, personally, is also described with another term that might seem kind of odd by our sort of typical stereotypic readings of Confucius, but I think it's a very telling one. The word that pops up over and over again is joyous, joyous. And this is how they'll describe him too. Like when in that example he walks into that room and just does something, they'll say he's this just joyous figure. He's this figure that everyone kind of wants to, to be around all the time because he's just so good when he, when he walks into a situation at just doing something that brings people together. And suddenly you get this set of connections with people and then these amazing things come out of it. And the disciples just love to be around him because he's, he's so joyous. The word for joy in Chinese is the same as music, and it's that same sense. It's like, the, like think of flawless musical resonance, like just notes that aren't the messy bang, 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 you're dragging out anger and, 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 and happiness, etc., but a kind of joyous resonance. And the goal of this would be, this is what we would be like, again, at this mundane level, as we achieve this humaneness, but then the argument is, he's doing the same thing at a larger political sphere too. Sensing what to do and sensing what to change. Now, let me say a few more words then about that larger political sphere. So 
some of this might make some degree of sense for these most mundane levels that we've been focusing on here. But what about these higher institutional issues? Like what about the fact that the ritual is assuming an hereditary society it wants to break down the habits of, but how do you break down an hereditary society at a more general level? Well, let's talk about how then political theory operates in Confucianism as well. Part of what I find intriguing about this tradition is it doesn't, and this follows logically from what we've seen, it doesn't operate by trying to lay out, here is the ideal world that we should try to strive for. for. Um, it's all about, as you can see, what would it mean to be in a more humane world where people are interacting and where people are being trained and, and even forced in early age to be educated, to be trained, to begin the self-cultivation process, but it's very open-ended as to what that will mean because the sense is at any given society there'll be different patterns that need to be worked on. However, there are some general pushes in the tradition. And one of those general pushes is one you can predict very easily, which is the tradition strongly pushes toward emphasizing education, training, and, and when you get to the governmental level, meritocracies. This push goes along the following lines. If you can get a society based not on heredity, but based on a meritocracy, but a meritocracy defined by those who are training themselves in the ways we have been describing, those then are the people who will hopefully be able to sense what sorts of things need to be done to help everyone else flourish. And over time, the idea is, even if you have no one single sage, collectively, the more and more such educated people you can have, the better you're going to be at sensing problems and working with them. And the problems are always going to be in these senses we've talked about. How do you shift the levels of interaction such that, such that there is true humaneness? Again, think of caring, but caring, as you can see, in a much deeper, broader sense than the way we tend to use that word in typical English lexicon. So let me say a few words about these types of meritocracies that are formed in China, building out of this tradition, the strengths and their weaknesses, and that will help point us toward rethinking where we will be going in the future if we want to revitalize the power of this tradition. So where this will take things in terms of institutionalization is the following. Over a span, of literally we're going to be jumping 2,000 years here. So over the next 2,000 years, what you will get in China is successive attempts to build meritocratic regimes. Now, let me begin with the incredible limitations of these, but then turn to some of the powers of them that we could then hopefully take seriously. But the limitations are serious too, because obviously there, there are patterns they were horribly failing to see that if we want to revitalize these, we would need to wrestle with at levels they fail to do. So let me begin with the first most obvious set of extreme limitations. So I've mentioned gender before. Um, the Confucian tradition was horrible in terms of breaking through patterns and habits of gender. To give the extreme example, when I discuss momentarily how these full-fledged meritocratic regimes operated, um, only women, I'm sorry, only men could even be considered for these positions of power. So we'll discuss momentarily the civil service exam, which is the means by which you can enter the government in China. Um, you have to be a man to take it. So an incredible overt limitation based upon, from this point of view, habits and patterns they completely fail to deal with. Another clear limitation that we will see is that it is, as we will note momentarily, completely open access in terms of taking the exam. Anyone can take the exam, as long as you're male, of any ethnicity. So there are examples of people who were born in Korea, um, but they become educated, they take the exam, they enter the civil service, and move right up. So there's no limitations of ethnicity of any kind. However, you do have to be educated, and you have to be educated in the classical literary tradition of China. So that example I'm just mentioning 
the person born in Korea, he's from a family that educates him in the proper Confucian classics that allows him to successfully take the exam. Number three, there's no attempt to build a mass education system. So it is up to the families to educate their children. And if you're from a wealthy family, you can do that. If you're from a non-wealthy family, you would oftentimes either not do it or you might just choose a son who will become educated, hopefully to pass the exam, and the others will not. So extreme limitations. But now let me say a few things that are fascinating about the way it worked, despite these incredible limitations. So if you look at the span of world history up until the emergence of capitalism in the 19th century, probably there is no stronger example in that long world history of an overt attempt to break down hereditary orders than what you're going to see in China. And the way they tried to do it is along the following lines. They moved toward, and in the last several centuries, this was put into place, a system in which the only way to gain access to a political position in China, with one significant exception they were never able to change, but with that significant exception I'll get to momentarily, every other position was available only by taking something called the civil service exam. The way you would take the civil service exam is you would, again, become educated in these classics, but the exam was not trying to test how intelligent you are, so it's not like a contemporary American SAT, which is trying to assuming some people are just more intelligent than others and we're trying to find out how intelligent you are. On the contrary, the view is we're all messes and the question is, are you training yourself or not? So it's aimed at testing the degree to which you are training yourself, yourself to see problems, work with problems, and shift problems for the better. So here's a typical exam question. It will say, imagine you're a magistrate in this local area it will lay out this incredibly complicated set of problems that by definition are not solvable in any easy way. And it will say, and you now need to write a memorial to your superior recommending what should be done. And you then write an essay making an argument. <laughs> and you're being tested not on whether you're right, I mean, by definition, the, the problems are beyond what are, are solvable, but you're being tested on the degree to which which you're seeing the complexities of the patterns, seeing the trajectory those patterns would be going, the dangers of the ways those patterns would be going, and what could concretely be done. You know, the equivalent of, of at a mundane level, of Confucius quoting a line of poetry, but now at an institution level. Build a bridge here, tax this group more here. <laughs> Very concrete things you would do, and then you would need to lay out how would this alter the habits and patterns toward a better trajectory. A good essay would then say, and here are the limitations of this approach, so here are some dangers of this, and I would recommend in five years we consider the following sets of things too as a further way to shift it. And the criteria is always, are you seeing these complexities? Are you coming up with concrete ways to shift things? And when you shift things, again, it goes back to what you see in the analects at these mundane levels. The shifting means creating situations where people are able to flourish through interactions with each other. So the more you can break down pre-given hereditary orders, the better. The more you can break down pre-given systems of control, the better. Um, but it's always coming down concretely. You can't just say that in an essay. You have to, it's concretely. You know, bridge here, tax this group here, this here. It's very, very concrete actions. Now, the result of this is you do get, and it's our only example in world history, a system in which every position of power is obtainable only by this means with one exception. <laughs> and this was a problem. You see this as early as Mencius. Mencius hated hereditary monarchy, and Confucians hated hereditary monarchy for the most part, I'll come back to an exception, um, throughout the next 2,000 years, they were never able to get rid of hereditary monarchy. So you still had an hereditary monarchy, but every other position of power was obtainable only by taking the civil service exam. Now, one other thing I do want to say about this is Part and parcel of this to make it work is 
you are as self-consciously as possible trying to divorce, therefore, political power from wealth, however obtained. If you're born into an aristocratic family or if it's obtained through the market, either way, you are trying not to allow that to give you immediate political access. The danger being, of course, that political access would almost assuredly mean you would try to recapitulate those patterns. If it's an hereditary pattern, you'd want to keep it. And so one of the goals of this system is you're trying to maintain that divorce. First, by hopefully having an educational and a training that's testing this, seeing if you are really being tra training yourself not to simply be a supporter of an hereditary order, for example. Also, in practice, what you would do if you're in the bureaucracy, they would have things like you would constantly be moved around. The idea being, if you're in one area for too long, you'll probably implicitly and not even being, being aware of it, fall into local powder, patterns of power. And so you're constantly being moved, even though that means you're usually being moved into places where you can't even speak the language um, because there's no standardization of, of, what, of what would become Chinese at this stage. And yet that scene is still better than actually becoming so embedded in the local arena that you would become part of those local patterns. So you get a self-conscious attempt to build a meritocratic order, breaking, not totally breaking down heredity, but trying to divorce wealth as much as possible from political power. Now, let me move then to a final concluding set of remarks, and then we will open up the discussion for the larger implications of all of this. What would this mean going forward? So first of all, let me mention some obvious things and then some more challenging things. So some of the more obvious things are the following. Um, to begin with an obvious example, we live in a world, by which I mean America, where we are currently living, that you could argue in terms of its unique definition of meritocracy, where the idea is precisely that it is through individualism defined in this limited way that we have been discussing that is seen as the basis of meritocratic principles. So what I mean by that is the following. You have an entire testing set of procedures, everything from an SAT to, to personality tests, that are all about aiming to find people based upon inherent things they have. So are you intelligent or not? And you try to get rankings of that through things like the SAT. We have personality tests that will try to tell you what you are, all of which assume you are already something of a certain level of intelligence and a certain personality type. And the goal of the educational system is essentially to move you into proper tracks based upon who you are and how intelligent you inherently are. And then the so-called meritocracy is moving from there. So you hopefully, if it's working, are getting the really intelligent people moving up and also moving them into spheres of life where they will be more successful. And if you can do that, then of course, by definition, the assumption is you'll have a so-called meritocracy where people who are super intelligent and really, really good at their own area will be, by definition, the ones in charge of it because they're the best at it. And a concern with divorcing wealth and power is, if anything, kind of not only not a problem, it's, it would be seen as itself what you don't want to do because the idea would be, well, of course you don't divorce wealth and power if you're a su very successful figure in X part of the marketplace of course, through lobbying efforts, you should be able to rewrite regulations for the government because you know that market really well. And, and if you're really, really good in another sphere, of course, that sphere should be one you control because you're really, really good at that sphere. And so you, the so-called meritocracy is based upon an assumption that we do have this inherent set of things, including this true self, and we're trying to build a system that will allow you to be successful in your career, in terms of wealth, in terms of political power, all of which are seen as directly interrelated. Note how different it is if you rethink the notion of a self, rethink what a meritocracy would mean, and therefore explicitly see your goal as emphasizing training not to just be who you already are, but to break what you are, to train yourself to be better than you could imagine yourself to be, in ways that you don't know in advance, and you try to build an institutional order along those lines. 
The other point I want to mention is, and this will return us to one of the key debates in this course, is the goal of this whole thing. <laughs> so, as we have noted in the previous two weeks, if the goal of transformation through radical notions of self-transformation, as we've been discussing the previous two weeks, is all about how do you create worlds in which we can be able to radically transform ourselves without falling into the dangers, as we've seen, of the romantic implications of that as they played out in the 19th century or the incredible domesticated versions of standard liberalism. Um, note, in this way of thinking, that is not your goal. You want transformation, but note, the transformation is all about training you and building worlds in which you and everyone else are precisely operating in a world of, and again, we have to, to expand our use of this term, um, care, or what they would call humaneness. It is all about having, ideally, figures in positions of power who are best able to sense how to create worlds where people can flourish. But again, people can flourish is not as self-transforming individuals, it's people can flourish in the sense of truly able to interact, or to put it back in the terms of early China, able to interact with each other as messes, <laughs> which means as messes, supple, able to be responsive, but then trained messes, which means that we are supple and able to be responsive in ways that are not remotely selfish, but actually aimed at caring and working with others. And the vision of this is, this is something you do in the most mundane aspects of your daily life, literally all the time, in terms of your immediate relations with others. And it's the same kind of work you're trying to do at a higher institutional level in terms of rethinking the worlds in which we are currently living. To give you a standard example that I will close on, they will say the following. Imagine putatively what things were like in distant antiquity before all that we have been discussing, even before the Bronze Age hereditary kingdoms. So back then, humans just lived in the world that they accepted as natural because it was just the world they were born into. And in that world, they would freeze to death when it got cold, and they would eat things that grew out of the ground, and a lot of them were poisonous, so, so they'd die. Um, and then, you know, tigers would, would eat us. Um, and then, because we were always you're sort of interacting as humans interact, and, and that would build out these patterns of angers and jealousies and resentments, we'd get angry at each other, and we'd often, you know, kill each other. And so that's what life was like. And that was natural in a, in a literal sense. Um, but then humans began the work of trying to alter those relationships. Like they began to realize it didn't just get randomly cold, it got cold at certain times, and we can call those things seasons and we'll categorize them. We can actually notice that some of those things that grow out of the ground that are poisonous but others aren't, and we can take those and replant those and domesticate them such that they start growing a lot. And these things that we've now called seasons, we can use that knowledge to actually build in our agricultural system so we can do this a lot. And with these things, that these bad energies, we can call them angers and jealousies and resentments. And once we categorize these different energies, we can begin working on those. And once we begin working on those, we can start creating ways in which we can kind of train ourselves to refine these energies and our responses. And we can call those things rituals. And we can come up with ways of categorizing these different energies and train ourselves to move them in our bodies and develop entire medical traditions out of moving them through our bodies because we are categorizing these energies and therefore working with them and refining them. And if putatively this is what happened in distant antiquity, Imagine it is identical for us. Identical not that we're born in that world, but imagine we're born into a world with the same kinds of problems, meaning that the world we live in, we tend to accept as natural and therefore just live within it. But what if you did like those putative humans did in distant, distant antiquity, where you realize actually no, we could transform all of this. 
in ways that we can't say in advance, but you transform it by just beginning to work on them. And that is the argument that Confucian political theory will consistently make. The consistent move is to say, you are training yourself based upon the assumption, which sadly they will argue, and I think accurately, will turn out to be the case, that you are embedded in habits and patterns, personally and socially, that you do not recognize, that you just accept as being who you are at the personal level and what humans are like at the societal level, and you're training yourself to begin the process of shifting that, shifting these relationships at a mundane level, shifting at a larger institutional order how institutions operate, always being guided by the assumption there are patterns holding us back that we don't yet see. And since we don't yet see them, that's why we do it through what they would call rituals through that constant work of breaking perspectives, opening possibilities, shifting things, but always with that goal of training yourself to sense the world around you. And let me just add one other wrinkle to this. Um, Mary tries to always leave about midway through the, court, to the, <laughs> the session, so I'll speak for a few more moments um, until he returns. Um, one other piece of this that's very intriguing. You might have noticed I've primarily been talking about these messes that we can categorize as humans. Let me bring in one other thinker who adds another intriguing twist that will be very important in the Chinese tradition. His name is Zhuangzi. Um, it's not part of the reading, but if you're interested, it's Z-H-U-A-N-G-Z-I. And Zhuangzi makes an intriguing move on Confucius. Basically, the argument is Confucius is absolutely right, but He's also right in the sense that he, too, had habits and patterns that he fell into and that led him to not see the full implications of what he was saying. And among Zhuangzi's critiques is to say, Confucius talked only about human beings and was only focusing on things that we could, in terms of the work of transformation, plausibly call rituals. And Zhuangzi's critique is we need to take his vision, which is absolutely correct, but dramatically expand it upwards and downwards. So upwards, this would mean you do the equivalent of ritual, except you're training yourself to literally see the world from non-human perspectives too, to see how these energies are embedded in a larger world. And at a lower level too, to the most mundane levels, things that would not even be what we could conceivably call a ritual, but he'll say, just the way, to go back to another example, you walk down that street, just the way you do daily activities, you're equally doing the kind of training work that Confucius would call a ritual. And this too would become an incredibly important part of the tradition, the idea being, if it's all about training, it should be all about training constantly breaking down those patterns, even those that a figure like Confucius, revered in the tradition, failed to see. So with that is a very brief introduction to Confucianism. Let me turn things first well, to Michael, Roberto uh, in a question, well, and then we'll open it up. Michael, I think I, I wanted to take the discussion in a somewhat different direction. Of course, absolutely. Uh, and, and I think that, I, to be fair now and for the class, I should postpone that to next week. Oh, OK. Uh, but let me ask you one question before we open up to the class. Uh, uh, you, you started your statement today with uh, a, a denunciation of, of the modernization idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one radical form of the modernization idea is Marxism. Right, absolutely. Uh, and uh, in China, uh, the birthdays of Karl Marx are celebrated, mm -hmm. unlike the birthdays of Confucius. Uh, uh, and so tell us something about this relation between Confucianism and Marxism. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to be a supposedly a, a <laughs> Marxist revolutionary Indeed. governing the society in the name of Marxist <laughs> ideas against the background of a Confucianist culture. Yes. What is this relation? What is this relation in theory and what, yeah, is, its, yeah. what is this relation in practice? Absolutely. Tell us something about that. Mm -hmm. 
So let me just underline the significance of the question. So what Professor Unger is referring to is the fact that right now in China, you have uh, a figure, Xi Jinping, who is both a self-proclaimed Maoist, I mean, not just a communist, Marxist, but a Maoist, which is we'll get to, is a, is a, is a very specific form of, of, of Marxism, and a Confucian, and is actively promoting both Maoism and Confucianism, which raises indeed many intriguing issues, I mean, certainly for, for, for China, but for us as well, in terms of it, philosophically, how would you possibly consider bringing together two things that would seem as diametrically opposed as imaginable, and indeed historically were? So certainly Mao, when he is undertaking the revolution, part of that move is to literally destroy all that we have been talking about, saying it was woefully inadequate, and literally the texts, including the ones you were, you were reading for, for today, are to be burned, the temples destroyed, um, and families were literally broken down to create a purely collective order. So absolutely an all-out rejection of everything that we've been talking about. Indeed, a figure Mao frequently compared himself to was a figure called the First Emperor of China, who in 221 BCE had formed the First Empire. That First Emperor famously burned all the books, destroyed all the temples, etc. cetera. Um, however, it was followed by a Han Empire that then brought Confucianism back. And so Mao's frequent statement was, I'm like the first emperor, but unlike the first emperor, I'm not going to fail. In other words, I'm really going to wipe this world out. <laughs> so as extreme a rejection of everything we've been talking about as possible, and now we have um, a self-proclaimed Maoist in Xi Jinping who is actively promoting Confucianism. So let's talk about what's going on there and philosophically what its implications are, because it has many, as we will see. So part of what is going on here is the following. So after Mao, of course, as we know, um, China takes a very, very different turn, um, beginning in the 1980s, but dramatically so in the 1990s. Um, China becomes one of the most laissez-faire neoliberal economies really in the entire world, I mean, much more so than America. So it becomes this radical laissez-faire capitalist system. Um, beginning with that, not surprisingly, is what we know from America, but, but, but dramatic in the self-proclaimed Marxist world, radical, radical income inequality. So you get for the first time you know, billionaires in China and a, I won't say impoverishment of the rest of the world because the government was trying very hard, and it's actually been very successful at pulling people out of poverty, but certainly not in trying to break down the kind of radical economic divide that those economic policies by definition start creating. Um, this began a significant pushback in China beginning in the early 2000s when people began saying, you know, we've, we've lost something essential, we've lost something that makes us Chinese, we've, we've become Americanized in, in the worst ways of, of just the pure American neoliberal system, much more so um, than America, and this needs to change. And a new left begins emerging in China involving self-proclaimed neo-Maoists saying, now we need Maoist ideas that would represent the population standing up against corporate worlds that are now taking over the government. Um, and Bo Lai was one of the major figures later sacked for corruption, but his major opponent was Xi Jinping, who very much continued the same argument with a crucial twist that will finally get us to the heart of the question. So when Xi Jinping rises to power, he very much rises out of a claim, I'm going to stand up against this American style of neoliberalism that had dominated China um, for the previous decade. Um, he's a self-proclaimed Maoist in doing so, so I represent an attempt of the people to break down this tendency that has grown of, corp of extremely wealthy individuals and corporations basically making government ineffective because they've taken over government policy and control regulatory policies just as they do in America and I'm following a Maoist critique to help the population as against this but then he adds this very intriguing twist which is going to be significant for where we'll be going in this course in terms of thinking through the implications and he argues 
one of the best ways of, out, of responding to these problems is to return to Confucianism. Why? Well, a piece of this we've already seen, but let me lay it out very clearly. The argument being that America represents, and, and China in the 1990s was taking this on, a world in which wealth and power are completely united. So if you become incredibly wealthy, either as an individual or as a corporation, you basically take over that segment of the government because the government becomes so indebted to you. In America, this is legalized in lobbying. In China, it wasn't called lobbying, but, but de facto the same processes were at work. And the argument is, actually, the Confucian tradition is the tradition that explains institutionally how to maintain a divorce between wealth and power. This is what the world needs in opposition to American neoliberalism. So we need to recreate that divorce of wealth and power. And how do you divorce it? We need to recreate a meritocracy. Now, Xi Jinping is not calling for a return to the civil service exam, but the way it operates is as follows. Um, it's all about saying, the current merit meritocratic system that's based in getting into colleges that are ranked by, by quality, um, those who make it to the top tier universities, and number one is Tsinghua, and get a top tier education at Tsinghua, so they get A's in Tsinghua, those are the ones the party will go to and say, would you be interested in joining the party? If the answer is yes, then you go to the central party school and you are educated in, you, many are already engineering students at Tsinghua and you're also educated in <coughs> economics, politics, etc. but thinking of them from an engineering point of view, which ties in intriguing ways to Confucian perspectives because the argument is you're not asking, okay, let's read Milton Friedman to find out you know, how to build a free market. Rather, you're reading it from the perspective of what are the ways America is using Milton Friedman to build certain types of markets? What have been the dangers that we started doing that in the 1990s? How do we build more effective markets? What are the ways in which a state should or should not intervene? How do we rebuild divorces between wealth and power? We can't do what they did in the 17th century, but how would we do that same sort of thing? Now, all of this involves building an incredibly strong state, to put it mildly, <laughs> building in meritocratic principles to staff that incredibly strong state, building a strong state that's all about creating an incredibly flourishing economy, all of which seems to be about as far from Maoism as you could go. But, of course, the argument from Xi Jinping, at least, is, well, if you can do this, it is still achieving the Maoist principles because this would allow a world in which the population could flourish in ways that Mao couldn't have imagined because he wasn't facing the problems of neoliberalism, but Confucianism gives us the ways of doing it. Now, some of this obviously, you know, obviously is, is based upon local indigenous issues going on in China, but I do think you're right. It raises larger questions for us that when you're wrestling with the implications of these ideas, we have to be ready and willing to take them out of their immediate categories that they have often been in historically and ask, how do we rethink them in the modern world? Xi Jinping is doing it in one way. We might not be convinced by that approach, but, but the attempt to rethink them in different ways is the sort of thing that I think we need to be willing to do um, as we rethink these ideologies for the world to come. Of course, uh, Michael, you neglected to point out that the main subject of study in the Central Party School is neither Karl Marx yes. nor <laughs> Confucius, yes. but second and third rate American social science. Absolutely. Oh, and, I, and I'll even expand the point. Um, I, it is absolutely fascinating. I mean, I, I, when, you, when you talk to people who have been trained in the Central Party School, and I've actually gotten some of the syllabi um, from the courses, and I mean, that's literally true. It's among the things they do is they will try to read the things that they think have become the standard ways of building contemporary America. So they will read Milton Friedman, but yes, they will read, and I, I'll even use your terms, I think it captures it perfectly, second and third-rate sociologists 
but they'll read them because they'll say, well, this is actually, whether people were physically reading them in America in the 1950s through the 1980s, um, it's telling of an American mindset that we want to understand and then rethink from this other perspective to say, how do we build a strong economy as America has done, but not fall into the dangers of America? So that's literally what they're reading. It's fascinating. So in, in your in your account of the of the relation between <coughs> Marxism and Confucianism, you chose to emphasize the theme of the separation of wealth right. and power, right. which is an important theme, but a in a way a subsidiary theme from a theoretical or philosophical point of view. What about the philosophical attitude to the transformation of the world? Yes. Uh, <laughs> what is how, how is that related, the Confucianist to the to the Marxist? Or is it just yes. not related? Um, I, I mean, it may not ultimately be related, but it is to a degree, and I'll use that to, to, well, to move it, to the bigger way of putting it. in their minds? Yes, so the way it's related in their minds is the following. So I mentioned the critique of American style of neoliberalism. Let me make the larger argument about the way America is portrayed in the world order. So the larger argument is the following. Neoliberalism is seen as the, the post-Berlin Wall falling <laughs> version of what is seen as a two centuries long period of world history. In that period of world history, the world came to be dominated by imperial powers, England being the primary one, and then America is just seen as a continuation of the British Empire. And the argument is that neoliberalism is literally just the neo-form of that same liberal world. And in that liberal world, the claim was it's a free market world where everyone can flourish, but in practice what it meant was the British Empire doing free market work, meaning you, you go into an area, you, you take over local society, you allow corporations to move in, use the natural resources, and that's called the free market in 19th century imperial um, England. And the argument is America has basically done the same thing in neoliberalism, so same ideology, same, same <laughs> vision of imperialism and that actually things like the United Nations, etc., are basically US-based attempts to, to simply continue what Britain was doing. Now the reason I say this in answer to your question is part of China's bid for world power is to say what we are going to offer the world is a different system because in that American system that is based upon states operating on behalf of, and to some extent even being controlled by, corporations and building an entire world order based upon that, what we are offering would be, and I'll emphasize for obvious reasons today the Confucian side of this, what China will offer on the contrary is a vision of strong forms of statecraft as opposed to the neoliberal claim that we're going to, to, to destroy the state and deconstruct the administrative state. On the contrary, you build a very strong administrative state. You build a strong administrative state that's all about building a flourishing economy, but it's aimed at not allowing incredible levels of social inequality. And then the claim is you can ultimately build a world that would be non-imperial because the imperialism of the past two centuries has been based upon one particular economic and political model that China would now be breaking. Now, needless to say, I'm not claiming that, that that last part is what China's actively trying to do. You could easily say China's trying to build another imperial order, but at least in ideology, the claim would be we will break down the American system of current world order that is simply a continuation of Britain, and the Confucian part is Confucianism gives us a guide of what that would mean. And that's why they'll emphasize this issue of, di of the divide of, of wealth and power. And the revolutionary personality as a disruptor who humiliates the elders, those in authority, seems to be psychologically at the opposite pole from the Confucianist ideal, or is it not? Well, n not necessarily, because uh, the way they will often put it, um, and you actually see versions of this in the ways that just uh, I've, stu I've got to know some students at Tsinghua who went to the Central Party School and they've described the way the classes cooperate. So the way it's often even put in the classroom is to say, well, remember what Confucius was doing in his world, which is trying to break down these hereditary orders he was living in, and 
we're doing the same thing. It's just that the, the American liberal order do, doesn't admit that it's a, a, the red, it's a, a basically an hereditary order without social mobility, but kind of is. And so we're doing the same kind of breaks he did. Now, getting back to the question, though, you're right, absolutely, and it's significant. They won't use terms like radical disruption, <laughs> etc., because for them, it's all about creating flourishing worlds that, not for Confucius, but later Confucianism involves very strong states and strong institutions. So it's not a language of radical disruption that's so typical in America, but they will say this would be trying to break down these hereditary orders and creating a world where people can flourish, which is seen as a, as a it's seen as a continuation of the work that Confucius was doing vis-a-vis -vis the hereditary orders before him. But again, with radically different terminology than radical disruption, certainly individualism is not the goal. <laughs> so, yes. Well, I wasn't thinking of American individualism. I was thinking of Marxism. Oh, yeah, and, oh, absolutely. And, uh, and no, absolutely. It's, it's, yes. it's incendiary <laughs> and conflictual character. Yes. And of the contrast between that and the moral right. psychology of Confucianism. Right. As you described it. Yes. And it's also telling, I mean, not to take this down purely to the world of, of, of current China politics, but it's a telling world. So, it's, so I think it, it opens up larger philosophical questions. I mentioned this, this issue between a Xi Jinping and a Bo Xi Lai. The, the latter, of course, was charged with corruption, and Xi Jinping later went on to, to power. But the very question you're asking was absolutely at play and was seen as such between these two. So Bo Xi Lai was not playing the Confucian card whatsoever. He was a self-proclaimed Maoist. I mean, a typical thing that would happen in, in um, Chongqing is you'd wake up in the morning and there would be a paper where Bo Xi Lai, leading the police, had charged into corporate headquarters of some big corporation at 3 a.m. Um, and said, I am taking over this corporation for the people because you've been exploiting them. And, and literally, then there would be a parade where people would sing songs that were obviously based upon Mao songs from the Cultural Revolution for Bo Xi Lai. I mean, it was literally, I'm recreating Mao. Needless to say, Xi Jinping never has done anything like that. I mean, Xi Jinping, I'm sure you've seen pictures of him, he's, he's, his whole stature is one of, of uh, I am going to work to create a, a world where people can flourish and be harmonious. And he's, his, despite the fact that he'll call himself a Maoist, he very much takes on the, the patriarchal, um, um, calm <laughs> figurehead versus a Bo Xi Lai that's all about, or was all about, <laughs> the, the, I'm the radical Maoist you know, leading the way. So yes, it's, it's a very telling, um, <laughs> local example of the very different personality types that animate these. Um, Xi Jinping is not seen as a disruptive Maoist in that sense, nor does he style himself. Let's open up. Yes. So let us open this up for, as always, anything, please. Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> so, so part of what I think we want to do in this class very much is when we've been saying we don't want to think of notions of radical self-transformation in the ways they've been domesticated in contemporary America. I would say you're absolutely right. Let's not do the same thing on Confucian ideas in terms of China. So the ways these ideas have historically been put into play, including in contemporary China, um, I, I think are helpful they're telling, but often they're helpful in telling in terms of hopefully po possibilities, but also they're telling in terms of limitations. And yes, how much of what I've described as the ideology is really in play? How much of this is simply legitimation for, <laughs> for a very autocratic state? I think it's a very open question. And regardless of our ultimate answers of that in the years to come, um, for us, I certainly don't think we should say, were we to take Confucianism seriously, that means we should you know, recreate the Central Party School of Contemporary China, <laughs> absolutely. Any more than for self-transformation, I think we should accept um, the current liberal order of America. I think in both cases we want to say, um, why are these being employed in certain ways? 
how in that employment is it being domesticated in ways that are, I suspect for all of us, seen as limitations, and how would we rebuild, hopefully, the powerful implications of rethinking them. So yes, I think that's exactly right. Yes. Yes, please. Great question. So it's really Confucian, um, but it's also very intriguing that in the early period, those terms don't exist. So, so people aren't calling themselves Confucian. I mentioned in passing Zhuangzi, who doesn't call himself a Taoist. The term didn't exist at that point. So in the early phase, what you're getting are these attempts to rethink the world that will later be put together into entire sort of visions of what that would mean. But as we've seen in the other traditions too, the ways that occurs is both telling, um, hopefully in an exciting way, but also in a limiting way. Because the, once you get into Confucianism as a state ideology, um, you get, I, what I suspect at least we would say, tons and tons and tons of limitations of what are other potentials that have not yet played out. Yes, exactly. Um, so it, early on, yes. Um, then, but, but I, I, yeah, the reason for, for, for the expression is, is you're absolutely right. The history of this is so telling. Early on, yes. So, so, but early, what they're doing is they're taking an earlier version of this, the eight you can actually trace into the Bronze Age, that didn't involve the role reversal. So in the earlier version, you simply call down the ghosts, you call on them to be ancestors in, this, in the sacred space, and in that sacred space, you say, we're descendants, you're an ancestor, please support us, we will feed you, you know, don't be a mean ghost to us, <laughs> um, um, period. And it wasn't about you know, altering the dispositions of, of the living. I mean, it was about really trying to create these ghosts into supportive ancestors. So in the Confucian tradition, that ritual is then taken. It's then transformed into altering relations of dispositions primarily among the living, like the way they'll often put it in these Confucian texts is, well, if, to stick with that example, granddad comes down, great, <laughs> hopefully he'll be transformed too, but even if he doesn't, like we still need to do the work amongst the living. So that's the Confucian version. Then it changes later again, and so you get attempts to even rework it, taking it out of the Confucian tradition and taking it out of the, the, the workings of living figures, which means you take out the role reversal. So that you get the Confucian version that does the role reversal, you get other versions that are still simply about feeding ghosts. So all of these continue. And I might add, just, just I mean, so that's an historical answer, but let me also make the philosophical point of view. Um, so essentially what that history would mean from the Confucian perspective is they would say, we've taken what they would call a custom, a sioux. So the custom would have been ancestor worship. We've taken that custom. We've made it into what we would call a ritual, which is about transformation of the participants, um, which was not necessarily the initial goal at all, or at least not at least defining the, the participants differently. And they would say that's the real ritual. Then when it continues without that work, they would say those other examples are still just customs, sioux. So for the Confucian tradition, ritual means this training of dispositions in terms of relations with others. Which, getting back to the heart of the question, does not mean all what we could call rituals in China fit this definition, but the Confucian tradition would call those customs. Sue. Yes. Great, please. and Marxism as this kind of disruptive force if it itself in history did not disrupt the ultimate authority, which was the emperor. So I'm, I'm trying to understand. Yes. Also, if you could speak to why that was the case, that it couldn't disrupt that. 
Yes, a wonderful question. And I made a passing remark that I didn't really d develop. And let me now develop it fully because you're absolutely right. This is going to be crucial. So I mentioned in passing this one figure, Mencius, who hated hereditary monarchy. Like literally the way he puts it is to say, well, uh, Hereditary monarchy was created at a certain time, what we would call the Bronze Age, um, during the Three Dynasties period. He literally would say the first figure who did it was the first to cast bronzes, so even then there was the acknowledgement that, that bronze was a key part of the, the ritual workings of that world. And he says, you know, before that, you didn't have hereditary monarchy. It was simply the most um, virtuous figure would be a leader, so it was a de facto non-institutional form of meritocracy. And then this horrible hereditary world was created. We'll begin to change what we can, and the goal is ultimately to get rid of hereditary monarchy, but we'll try to change everything else. And that critique continues, the Menchian critique. But, and, and you're absolutely right to bring this up, there is a whole other side of Confucianism that doesn't like hereditary monarchy, but says it's better than what we've come up with as an alternative. And just to give you a name in case you're interested in looking this up, so the figure in question is a figure called Shunzi, who is one of the early critics of Mencia, so it's X-U-N-Z-I, and he gives a very intriguing argument. So his argument is, so he's one of the first, unlike Mencia, who begins arguing for an institutionalized meritocracy, saying we need to build a bureaucracy of, an, of a meritocratic, educated group that would actually be running the, the state. But then he says, well, in terms of this hereditary monarchy, um, Mencius is wrong because if we really believed we could create a flawless, perfect meritocracy that truly would only bring in people who truly were training themselves to break out of habits and patterns and become truly humane and see the world, then that would be great. But he said, we just need to be honest with the fact that we'll continue to do this and hopefully get better and better for periods of time at doing it, but we'll never do it fully. And even when we do it, even if we did it really well for a period, in a few generations, like patterns will reset that we won't even notice. And so then he argues, given the fact that that's the case, so he's a very pessimistic in this sense, but also very realistic, we need something else in power that's kind of a push against the bureaucracy, just in case the bureaucracy does become overly embedded in, in patterns, because who would break it? And then he said, well, maybe having an hereditary monarchy is not a bad thing, because it, it's a separate moment of gaining power, um, separate means of gaining power. And if you have a bad monarch, which is you know, often going to be the case, that's OK, because the bureaucracy can usually take control, which is historically, in fact, true. Um, you know, bureaucracies are very good. Like if a king says, do x, the bureaucracy says, oh, yeah, we'll form a committee and talk about that. And you know, the years go by, and then, then the king forgets about it. But Shunzi will say, sometimes you need the opposite. Sometimes you actually need a king who can develop different means of power to undercut his own bureaucracy. And he says, well, that's actually kind of good. And he actually takes the argument even further, and this will get us closer to, to issues what will, in, our, in political theory today, he'll even say, well, in fact, the more spheres we have like this, the better. So if you took a Shunza to, and plopped him into contemporary America and took the vision of let's make everything into a market. So, so everything should be defined as a marketplace, both the economy, but also the political world, the educational sphere, the familial sphere, et cetera. Ashunza's immediate response would be to say, actually, no, regardless of what we do with the economy, and he has a whole tracks on the economy, he would say, you definitively want separate spheres. So you want a political order that is not, again, controlled by money coming from the economic sphere, you want a separate sphere, then you want lots of other spheres. So a human being just through their day's existence is in a family, then they go off to work, then they do something else. And he says simply going through spheres will in itself help in this process, which is why institutionally you don't want everything controlled by a bureaucracy, because in the long run that's probably too, too dangerous as well. Now, I say all of this not to say therefore I would suggest we advocate hereditary monarchy, but I do think it raises an intriguing question that if Schunz is on to something, the implication of this would not be, therefore, let's, if we were to, to institutionalize along these lines, let's create a perfect institutionalized bureaucracy. We should also, if Schunz is on to anything, say what, but what would be the inherent dangers of meritocracy, how are we defining merit, how are we defining the bureaucracy, and what else are we building in that could sort of push against it? <laughs> what, are there other means that could push against it? Um, 
obviously one that's, that's arisen is elections would be a possible way of putting against it. And then Shunza might say, yes, but then be sure you've got something to push against elections. Like that's where he would say a bureaucracy can be really helpful. And so part of what's animating at least to Shunza is you want different spheres of power to prevent anyone from having too much ability to create an overly coherent world that almost by definition would be based upon limiting patterns. So that gets back to the heart of your question. Why did the Confucians not really get rid of it? The truth is there was only one strand that even wanted to. <laughs> um, the Shunzian strand thought it's actually not that it, it, it's good to have hereditary monarchs, but it's good to have something that's not based in the civil service exam, which is an intriguing argument given this, this notion of messy cells that form into habits and patterns. Yes. But a revolutionary yes. oh, yes. would think that the countervailing power is, is not the king. The countervailing power is the people, so organize them. Yes, absolutely, right. absolutely. And, and here, it, it does point to a significant issue we'll need to wrestle with, because that's absolutely right. One of the, the and, and, and depending on how we want to phrase this, so I'll pr phrase it both ways, <laughs> the powers and or limitations of this way of thinking is it's all about giving power to the educated and the trained. And absolutely, there, it means there's built into this tradition a tendency not to grant too much power to uneducated, untrained. And I think that's obviously a, a danger and, and a limitation. But of course, the flip side of that is you could say, could we then build in better forms of mass education, better, in other words, that exist today, um, that would actively be trying to do that? So part of the challenge would be to say, you want separate spheres, but you want separate spheres that can operate against each other in ways that would be productive. Now, I put it that way because, of course, if it's simply an educational sphere, I mean, this is what Shunzu would say immediately, if it's simply an educational sphere that has a pre-given assumption as to how the education should work, which he would say is what the civil service would be aiming toward, he would say that's going to be a danger. Like, it's good, <laughs> but you want something else. So that, but that's something else he would want to be a different type of education, which again raises all the sorts of bigger questions. Yes, yes, please. Uh, Professor Andre, to what force are the Chinese political leaders getting by studying the second and third rate um, social studies? What, what? What influence are the political uh, elite of the, uh, China, the leadership, getting that are incorrect? Well, this is sort of, I mean, your question is perfectly legitimate, but, uh, but. Uh, it's far away from the agenda of the course, which I hope will come back to next week. But uh, I, I'll tell you frankly, I think China, like my country, Brazil, and like many countries in the world, is bent under a double yoke. Uh, on the one hand, uh, a political autocracy, a despotism of the party. Uh, we have a flawed democracy. China has no democracy at all. Uh, and, and the second is mental colonialism. So it's the strangest thing. The, the Central Party School is studying this trash <laughs> from, from the American Academy. And, and uh, so th those, are, those are the ideas. So it's a bunch of unimaginative engineers governing the country. Uh, every so many years, they put the picture of Karl Marx on the wall. They play the Internationale. They all stand up. They play the Internationale. They don't sing it. Uh, and uh, so it, the, it's this combination of the weakness of democracy with the weakness of thought. So what are the ideas? No ideas, uh, and but so, but, but that's a very common situation in the world. So, what are the two forms of disruption that would be possible in such a system? One would be a rebellion against mental colonialism, uh, uh, and an affirmation of originality in the sphere of thought. And the second great force of disruption would be the rising of the people from below, 
some demand for the radical democratization of power, which would have to take institutional forms different from the forms that it takes in the North Atlantic countries. And what would be truly revolutionary would then be the marriage of those two forces, revolution in thought and revolution in the organization of power. Now, I think the kinds of things that they discuss um, seem to have no relation to that, to all of that. And that makes those other things, those forms of disruption seem impractical. But it's not true. There is a relation. So for example, a main topic of practical discussion in political economy in China is how is, how is China going to shift the focus of economic growth from export-led growth to the deepening of the internal market? And then the export-led element will be simply a complement to production for the domestic market. Now, and this is what they call the dual circulation model. Now, the problem is that th this transfer of the emphasis from export to inside is not a mere accounting operation. It's not just a technical reorientation. It involves massive redistribution among regions, among sectors, and among classes. And, re and massive redistribution is always conflictual and therefore a threat to the, to the political order. That's why they can't do it. That's why they have trouble doing with it. So, there has to be a national debate, a national conversation in some form. There have to be distinct ideas in political economy, intellectual revolution, and therefore this combination of a transformation of power in power and a transformation in thought. That's what Karl Marx would recommend to them. But uh, they're just putting his picture on the wall and, and and pretending to genuflect to him. They're not following his spirit. So that, that's the answer to your question. Yes, please. Um, I think there have been uh, some similarities between Confucius and Aristotle. Yes. The idea of self-training of how virtue uh, yes. is uh, being used. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I agree that when you're looking at the specific focus on training, yes, Aristotle and Confucius share a huge amount, and again, they're roughly contemporaries, which is fascinating. Um, the differences are telling too, and those obviously play out when you look out the political implications of them later. So Aristotle is absolutely committed, as was much of Greek thought and, and later much of Western thought, to the notion that at heredity, so I mean at birth, I mean, we are hereditarily pre-given certain possibilities. So he fully took for granted that slaves are slaves because they're less intelligent, those who are capable of training themselves are, are Greeks like himself, high-born Greeks like himself, and he thought that was hereditarily given. So when you t do the work that Aristotelians do, which is, I think is the work they should be doing, of saying what are the powers of Aristotle that we can build upon, it really means taking a piece of Aristotle and pulling it out from the rest. And I think that's the work that needs to be done. Um, part of what's, of course, intriguing about Confucius on this perspective is there the claim is, no, we, and by implication, everything is a mess, Everything that exists in the world is a construction, usually a construction made passively out of just passive habits we've fallen into, um, but it equally could be constructed actively. And although he doesn't work out the implications of that, the tradition is kind of based in working out what it would mean to construct a world more effectively. And so the kind of work that the tradition has to do with the Confucius is very different from the kind of work that, that well, not, not that it was done through much of the tradition, but current Aristotelians are doing with Aristotle. And the historical implications of that are powerful. I mean, if you look at the way Aristotle was read until the 20th century, um, 
none of what I just mentioned is really part of that discourse. Um, if you look at the way Confucius is read in the tradition, not to say that every reading is, is going to be convincing, but these are the issues they are actively wrestling with. So that's why in terms of this course, we've chosen Confucianism as a key example of this way of thinking because with Aristotle sort of pushing it in this direction, it's really been a primarily a 20th century move, whereas in China you actually have 2,000 years of active work. So it sort of gives us more to sink our teeth into in a certain sense philosophically. And to ending on that comparative note, I think that's a perfect place to conclude today's session. So next session, of course, we will be then turning to trying to work out what it would mean to be taking these ideas that we've been stressing in the tr Confucian tradition and asking what would it mean to rethink them for the current world in their most powerful philosophical formulation, working out of the limitations that we have seen of the ways they've been institutionalized thus far in world history. Thank you so much and see you in two. Oh, yes, yeah. Wait. No, wait, no clapping yet. Wait. <laughs> I'm going to begin with a different take on Confucianism, and then we're going to go from there. Good, good, good. <laughs> so the debate will begin with a different take. <laughs>